I'm going to give people a couple minutes. We're being. You do a great job with that, Dick. Nice. You're not going to the caucuses? Right, okay. Yeah, you don't pre vote for the caucus, so. Right. You're probably running it, too. I tried them in the new Senate district. Uh, they said I don't, they don't need your help. Oh. I offered to print the forms free. Mm -hmm. We don't need that. So my old Senate district came over, used the forms that I wrote, and I printed. So if you go to the, the caucus mm -hmm. in the old Senate district, you'll see all my work. Fabulous, we Dick. I really wrote what the department provided. Fabulous, Dick. I decided I'm going to create my own. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good. So nobody ever objected. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to get started here. Mm -hmm. I haven't started. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what promises to be a delightful winter day here in Minnesota. Um, you're coming out to uh, our forum that is about the presidential nomination primary, and which is coming up on March 3rd, and the uh, precinct caucuses, which will be held this coming Tuesday, the 25th, uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, so check uh, the Secretary of State website and find out where you can do your caucusing. Uh, my name what is that website? Which is uh, SOS... MNVotes.org. Oh, MNVotes.org. Gets you right to uh, the elections and voting page. Fantastic. MNVotes.org. Uh, okay, so my name is Liz Lauder. I am the president of the White Bear Lake Area League of Women Voters. And I want to welcome you to our forum, our informational forum today called um, Are You Ready for Super Tuesday? Details the Voters Need to Know. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that has spent the past 100 years uh, encouraging voters to be informed and to take an active part in the government that represents them. Uh, if you have time after the, the forum, you can take a look at the posters that we made this past fall. Um, it has to do with the 100 years of the League of Women Voters and women voting, uh, the women's suffrage movement. So. Glad to have those out here today. And if you would like some refreshments, we have some in the back of the room there. Um, and then the uh, bathroom is out to the out the door and to the right. Um, so the forum is being recorded and will be available later on on the Suburban um, Community Channel's uh, television and their YouTube site. And then will be available later on our League of Women Voters website, which is lwv-wbla.org. Uh, the way our forums work is uh, the speaker will be speaking, and if you have questions while you listen, you can write them on the cards that we've provided for you, and then um, just get you know um, get the eye of somebody who can collect the cards for you. We've got uh, Carol over there and Lisa over here, and they'll be collecting the cards for you, and then I will be reading the questions because this keeps the the program moving along more smoothly and gets us done in time. Um, so let me, uh, let me just uh, introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, we have with us uh, Michael Wall, who is the uh, voter outreach specialist for the Secretary of State. And uh, it's his job to teach people about the voting process. And I can't think of a, a more simplistic or, or very simple, easy to understand job description. I, I wish all of us had such uh, easy to understand job descriptions. Um, and so he has a background in secondary and um, higher education and also uh, in relationship development. 
He's been in this position with the state of with the Secretary of State's office for the past four years, and um, we appreciate him being able to fit us into his busy schedule. He's been um, doing this presentation for the last four months. Um, he's done at least 20 of these, I think. <laughs> he's even doing one tomorrow, which is, you know, that's that's like above and beyond the call of duty. So please welcome Mr. Michael Wall. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here on a lovely Saturday in February. Um, I'm looking forward to melting. I don't know about you, but um, what we're going to do here today is to talk about the new presidential nomination primary, and then when that's all done, um, are you going to do it with me? Yes. yes. Um, we're going to present someone else's um, PowerPoint on the caucuses. Uh, we'll see how much basic information versus what's different. If everyone has been to their caucus before. Uh, but we have that as well, and that comes to us from my friend Nick Harper at the State League uh, of Women Voters. And um, I am quite comfortable with the idea of getting all those questions on cards. So we just go one question to another and you don't lose any of the flow. So please do utilize them and pass them along. And next slide, please. So what I plan to cover is this. What is this thing, this new presidential nomination primary? Why do we have it? Things seem to be working just fine before, or did they? Who's running the election itself? And it's not written here, but whose election is it? Uh, who can vote in this presidential primary? And we'll connect it as well to uh, similarities and differences to other elections. So how is it going to work? And most people focus on uh, the idea that you have to choose a ballot, which is a new Minnesota thing. and. How does that work? What if you change your mind? Who knows which ballot I chose? We'll talk about all of that. Uh, and will a party, a voter's party choice be recorded? That's the subject of a lot of discussion of those who have heard about this primary. Um, anyone know what year the legislature voted to have a primary? 2016. Yep, just following. The caucuses, yes, the very challenging time in the caucuses, and then we'll actually, do you want to do questions and answers on this first part first, or do you want to do the caucus thing as well and then take questions? Um, questions as we go. I think questions like the, after, for your presentation and then. And then, great. Okay, next slide, please. So, and, and I have given this. 20 times, so I'll talk for a while and then we'll kind of catch up where we are on the, the PowerPoint. This election, the presidential nomination primary, is your party's vehicle for getting help to decide who their nominee will be in November. This is the same vote that we used to do, if you, how many people here have gone to their party's caucus in a presidential year? Fabulous. So if you haven't, and this is a little sneak peek at the second presentation, but a party caucus, a precinct caucus, is a local group of party affiliated people run by party volunteers, and it does three or four things uh, at that meeting. Generally, it's a couple of hours, maybe three, depending on the agenda, on a Tuesday night, and you arrive, you sign in, uh, you give your name, your address to show that you are in that precinct, um, your contact information, I believe, is asked of you, and there's a statement that generally says, I generally agree with the principles of this party, which is the filter to you want to help us make decisions, you should generally agree with the party. And in that caucus, a few things are done. One is that 
there are resolutions. People get to say, I believe the party should stand for this, and I'd like this added to the party platform. So there's resolutions. There is the election of delegates to go on to the next level, eventually to the state party convention, and then the national convention, where you see those long sticks with Minnesota at the top. And um, there is that. There are local candidates who come in and pitch for themselves why they should be supported uh, by party members. Uh, and there used to be a straw poll, a non-binding informational vote of who each individual caucus goer thought the party should nominate and be that party's nominee for the general election in November. This election is just that vote plucked out of the caucus and made an official Minnesota election, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the caucuses are everything else they used to be. They're this Tuesday, February 25th, 7 p.m. And as we were told, you can find your caucus location as well as your voting location, your poll location, on our website, mnvotes.org. I'll probably say that at least five times. Um, so caucuses continue, still doing party business. And on March 3rd, Super Tuesday, what will take place is the party's election to find out who party members and those who feel connected to an individual party believe should be that party's nominee. That's all that will happen on March 3rd. Let's see what our next slide is, please. We'll talk more about the mechanics and what will take place on March 3rd. But this slide says why, why do we have it? Because as this gentleman said in the front, way to go sitting in the front row. <laughs> in 2016, many caucus sites were overwhelmed with the turnout, an embarrassment of riches, a great problem to have, lots of reactions you could use, but some people said disenfranchisement. Uh, it wasn't a November election, but it is a part of the process of presidential election, and we do have a system that utilizes parties. So some people had to park literally a half a mile away <laughs> in February and walk. Anybody get that kind of, yep. Some people, not, uh, I'll tell you my personal experience uh, in St. Paul, by the way, I lived in White Bear Lake, before, so yay, bears. Um, but uh, in St. Paul, where I live now, I went to Harding High School. I parked, I don't know, it was about a quarter mile away, and I walked. Luckily, I am mobile. I don't have any challenges that way. But I walked, and I always show up everywhere early. So I took a seat in the back. I don't tend, working for the Secretary of State's office, to like to be in the front of something like that, but I took my seat in the back and eventually gave up my seat to a woman who came in after people took every other seat. And then I saw people line the walls of this classroom, gather in the doorway, and I was reported by one of the volunteers, the party volunteers, that the line went out into the hall, down the hallway, and halfway down the stairs. So you have access issues, and these are only for people who could show up on a Tuesday at 7 p.m. If you go to, and I went to both of the participating major parties' websites, if you go to the, um, the DFL's website, there is, under caucuses, what do I do if I can't attend the caucus? And I expected, working for the Secretary of State's office, the alternatives. The response on that website, at least the last time I checked, was basically, well, you can tell your boss that, that you have to be let go if you give them 10 days or a couple of weeks notice, that you have to be able to go. 
That's the sole response. So legislators worked with the parties to make this opportunity, even though they are elections held by and for private organizations. That's what political parties are. But legislators said people need access, and that's why this law was passed in 2016 and then amended in 2019. So what are some of the advantages? 46 days of early absentee voting. 46 days. There is no excuse to not be a part of this vote, even if you can't go to the caucus, because you can do it at home over Secretary Simon says, you can get the ballot mailed to you and do one um, office over Cheerios and then a week later, another office on your lunch break. There's only one office on March 3rd in the primary, but still, you can look at it over Cheerios and decide over lunch, it's totally up to you. And that ballot can be returned by dropping it off, by sending it in the mail. There are lots of easy ways to get it back to your county. So there's early and absentee voting. There's also an election day that's 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. That allows a lot more people just in that to participate. There's also the infrastructure. We don't have people looking through pieces of paper. We have ballot counting machines, ballot marking machines for accessibility. We have 30,000 election judges supporting. It, it's all the infrastructure that every Minnesota election has. It's a huge advantage to allow people to access this election. Though those are some of those benefits right there. What's next, please? So who's running it? As I said, these are the elections of the parties. There are four major parties in Minnesota. The law says that major parties may participate. Two of them, the two that became major parties by having 5% or more of the votes cast in statewide elections in 2018, are both single issue state parties. They could have participated if they wanted to hold national conventions, which really would be a state convention because they are Minnesota parties, but both declined. And the two other major parties everyone is familiar with did decide to participate. So four possible participants, two decided to participate. Those parties in 2016 had to work with the legislature because the legislature wanted to establish a primary, but the parties didn't have to agree. Because they're private organizations, they literally could say and did, if you're gonna hold it this way, have at it, spend your money, but we're not gonna pay any attention to it. The issue that is at issue for a lot of people is that not only do you have to choose a ballot, how many people have voted in the August statewide primary? One ballot, columns by party, and you just have to stick in a column because again, it's a party vote, you're helping the parties go from three candidates for that party for this office to one, or seven to three, if it's that kind of three positions. But even then in August, we are helping the parties to whittle down their list. Here, the parties said, just like the caucus vote, where people signed in and we knew who came to vote, and let's be serious, parties want that information so they can contact you, right? They want you to talk about their candidates, to vote for their candidates. They want you to get out the vote, to go vote yourself, and they want to raise money. Nothing wrong with any of that. Here, if it had been like the August statewide primary, if it had been like Secretary Simon asked in the beginning, in 2016, 
my boss pushed for the choice of ballot to be private. No one would ever see. The chair of the Republican National Committee and the chair of the Democratic National Committee, I was told, sitting side by side, said, it's your choice. You can do that if you want, but there won't be a Minnesota delegation at the National Convention. So no people holding up that sign with the long stick. They believe, and it's their right, that that information of who voted in their primary belongs to them. So in 2016, the law was passed making that choice of ballot never, I want to stress this, never who you voted for, because not only would that be incredibly illegal, but we don't track that. No one does. There's no way to connect an individual with a vote once that vote has been cast. So in 2016, it was, as a part of the original law, public information. In 2019, the law was amended to make, it's kind of the best phrase I think is private but, or if you like, private except. That choice is not part of the information that voters, any Minnesota voter, let me say as an aside, can get a list of voters in Minnesota. What your name is, what your address is, your phone number, if you included it on your voter registration, and which elections you have taken part in. That, those lists, by law, are available through our office. You pay $30, you can get your county, a list of everyone who has voted and their contact information. Those public lists are restricted by law, can only be used for elections, campaigning, or law enforcement. That's it. So as of 2016, anyone could have gotten that information. Michael Wall, St. Paul with my address, and which ballot I chose for the presidential primary would have been a part of that. In 2019, it's taken off of the public list, but given to all four major party chairs. It's good to know that this law gives a lot of power over this election to the chair of the major parties. One example I have here, this is kind of like Johnny Carson, Karnak. I have here laminated copies of the two ballots, which, by the way, you can get 46 days ahead of time because now that it's a primary, sample ballots are always available on our website for every election 46 days ahead. So here is the Republican ballot for the March 3rd presidential primary. You'll see it's pretty darn short. It has one name and a write-in line. Why? Because the law says that the chair of the major parties decide who goes on the ballot just for this vote, just for this election, the presidential nomination primary, and if there will be a write-in line. Jennifer Carnahan, chair of the Republican State Party, gave us a list. And by the way, the law also says that as of December 31st, that's it. Your list is your list. There are no changes, and we'll talk about that and this long list in a second. But she gave us one name, and then I think within a week, and it was still before December 31st, said, we want to write in. And any party that asks for a write-in on the, well, let's call it the PNP ballot, uh, has until a week before the election, which this year is caucus day, this coming Tuesday, to tell us in the Secretary of State's office who needs to get counted across the state. So Bill Weld has been a declared candidate for the Republican nomination for a while. He's not on here. But if the party decides, and I believe they're going to tell us Monday, that was the last news I got. But if Jennifer Carnahan says, count Bill Weld, then anyone who writes in Bill Weld's name, those votes will be tabulated and gathered with all the rest of the Bill Weld votes. 
if somebody puts in uh, Mickey Mouse, unless Jennifer Carnahan says count Mickey Mouse, no one will ever know. Here is the Democratic ballot. 15 names, a number of whom are no longer running, but because the law says December 31st, that's your list. Cory Booker and others are still on the ballot. And there's also an uncommitted, a let the delegate vote according to their conscience possibility, but there's no write-in. Why is there no write-in? Because the chair of the DFL didn't want to write it, and that's what the law allows. Who can vote in this thing? This is an official Minnesota election, so the law is the same for August 11th, November 3rd. It's the same people. You need to be 18 on the day of the election, which means if you're going to be 18 on March 3rd, but you're not 18 now, you can vote early. You can get an absentee ballot, you can go to the county elections office on West Plato uh, and get uh, your absentee ballot. And seven days before, starting seven days before, you can actually get your ballot and put it into the tabulator. It's the same rules. It's important to note that this is a difference because, as you may know, if you are 17, but you're going to be 18 by November 3rd, the major parties have allowed those students to be voting participants of the caucuses. As long as you're going to be 18 by the general, if you want to be a part of the caucus, no problem. That doesn't exist anymore because the law says, and now this is a state election, you've got to be 18 by election day. My kids, I have twins, they turn 18 in September. My son couldn't care. My daughter is not pleased. <laughs> She wants to vote in the primary and cannot, but that's the law. All of the other things, your residency in Minnesota for at least 20 days, which by the way is not you have to be in state, it's that you have a declared residency for at least 20 days. Um, that you're a US citizen, that you're not currently serving a felony sentence, probation, parole, anything there. Uh, that a court has not taken away your right to vote. All of that is the same. Next, please. The, as I said, the infrastructure, the process is exactly the same as any other vote, except when you go to sign in, there are two differences. So if anyone has ever actually voted at a polling place, you know you go up to the roster judge, you greet them warmly because this is Minnesota, and you give your name, and they look you up. They may clarify your address if there's more than one Michael Wall in my precinct. There never is. And then they'll turn the roster around and ask you to sign. That's what we normally do. And you sign not only, well, you sign there is a by penalty of perjury oath that says, this information is true, and I am who I say I am. And that's, that's a federal crime if you lie about that. And those all go to the county attorney. What's now on the roster, or if you have a polling pad um, on that tablet, are two additional things. One is that you have to choose which ballot you would like to receive, and that's recorded. There's either a checkbox and a paper roster, or you're gonna press a button. You don't tell someone out loud. And the other is that there's an additional, it's not really an oath. This is not punishable by perjury, but it's pretty much the same statement when you go to the caucus. I generally agree with the principles of the party whose candidate I intend to vote for. This is not a vote for people who are of one party to say, I'm going to mess with the other party, that, but it is not punishable by law because the law isn't set up to have any consequences. It's a statement. So by signing, you sign to both of those things. You'll get your receipt 
as usual, and your receipt will have the name of the party whose ballot you just requested. You go to the ballot judge, he or she will take it. Kathy Welchel, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> they'll take it, they'll give you the ballot that you asked for, and they'll put it, and however they're storing it, upside down, because it isn't the next voter's right to know which ballot you chose. And then you go and vote, and you put it in the tabulator, same as usual. Next one, please. Keep going. Oh, one thing that was on the last one, and this is different than the last time we had a primary in 1992. In 1992, we had a primary for one cycle. The law had changed. But the electors, the delegates, were not bound to follow the outcome of the election in Minnesota. They were in 1956 and 52, the two before that, but in 92 they weren't, which means it was just kind of nice to know, but we're gonna vote the way we want. According to the law that was passed in 2016, those delegates must follow in the first round of voting in the national uh, convention for each party, and the parties agreed to this, that that first round, those delegates must reflect the outcome of the vote. So if candidate A gets 60%, candidate B gets 20, and candidate C and D get 10 each, and that adds up, I taught math, <laughs> then the delegates are assigned that way. After the first round, if they don't get the number they need, and by the way, that has not happened since 1956, since then, they've always made their decision in the first round, but party rules are what determines what happens for that next round. But for the first round, the law states, and the party said yes, that those delegates have to reflect the outcome of the election. Uh, separate ballots, we talked about that. Absentee, keep going, please. Yep, we talked about mostly private. And I'll say this again, that it was the bolded part in the, the last um, page, but there's no way for anyone to ever know who you vote for. The information that's shared with the four major party chairs is just which ballot you ask for. And I know that that is a, a visceral, I mean, there, for Minnesotans, we have never had any kind of party registration since we were founded. It's true, but, and I'm stepping aside from my position and giving you a personal thing right now, that we had to give our parties our information. Our parties knew that we were participating before. The difference here is that the other major parties now also know that you, not a member of, but that you in some way affiliated with your party, the one that you chose their ballot. Does that in any way commit you to voting in a particular column in August? No. For any particular candidate in November? No way. There is no connection to any other vote or choice you make, which includes going to the next caucus. No one can say to you, sorry, I know you say you generally agree with the principles, but we have a list here and you voted, um, you took the ballot of the other, they can't do that. So there is no consequence or connection other than the fact that this law, differently from the list that registered Minnesota voters can request that we talked about earlier, this law has no restrictions on what the parties can do with that information. Can they post it online? Yes. Would they? I think it would be rather silly. I think there'd be a huge backlash. So we don't expect that to happen. But currently, there is no legal restriction on what they do with that. Next, please. I'm not a lawyer, 
But I can tell you that I did some research and I talked to our legislative director, and there is no constitutional issue with requiring people to choose a ballot. It, it happens automatically in some states where you're, to participate in a primary, you must be a registered member of that party. We don't do that here, but obviously it isn't legally problematic to require that or none of those states would be able to do what they do. Um, if you have more questions on that, your legislators, I think, would be a good resource. And if you would, keep going. <coughs> Some people have already asked, so I will just touch on it here, but with no real specificity. And you can go to the Q&A page. Are there bills already submitted to change who would get this information of which ballot you chose and what they are legally able to do with it? Yes. That's all I can tell you. Because I don't even know at this point whether the initially filed bills have been amended already. But if you're curious, your state legislators are the folks to ask. One more? One more? One more? Frequently asked questions. Is this free? No. Estimate is about $12 million. Why would the legislature agree to pay millions of dollars to move the vote from the caucus to its own primary? One answer, access. The legislature believed that people were being shut out of an important part of the presidential election process, and that wasn't okay. So the original estimate was lower than this substantially, but the way that it works is that um, the counties and cities get reimbursed. They track the money they spend on, on personnel who work on the, uh, the PNP, on printing, on whatever it is they spend money on to make this election happen, the state reimburses them. Uh, we talked about 1992, 52, and 56, and the other primary we've held in Minnesota was in 1916. And the third bullet is basically just that, and I put this in because I find it amusing. In 92, we had a primary. As we got close to 96, they said, eh, let's put it on hold. People weren't happy about spending money. People weren't happy about the process, uh, about the delegates not being bound. And then in 1999, they said, let's just scrap that law. And that's how that went. Next one. That's my outline. Oh. <laughs> Do we have questions? Wow. Thank you. Well, that was such a complete talk. I don't know that we could <laughs> need, need any questions, but um, some of these things might it might be good to reiterate um, what was all included in your talk. But um, so will a voters party preference data be collected at other elections? No, because there is no other election that has multiple ballots. So the closest thing we have is the August statewide primary. But as we talked about, that's a single ballot. Everyone gets exactly the same ballot and it's never connected with who voted in what column because it's completely anonymous once you get that ballot. So there is no way to track that or to know. This is the only one for now. And I say that because who knows what the legislature will do. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, you might have talked about this already, but are there any restrictions on the use of data collected? What do I need to worry about, if anything? That was, we talked a little bit about that in, at the end. The current law has no restrictions on what the parties can do. Do I expect that a party will say, why would you want to vote for that party? You should vote for us. And here's that, that you may get additional mailings. Sure. Even fundraising pitches. If someone determines it's worth spending the money, 
to send it to, just as an example, to Democratic voters in a mainly red area? Why don't we just send them fundraising material anyway? You may get those now if things are sent out by a zip code. So who knows what the four major parties may do with the law in its current state, but there is no legal restriction. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, it seems as if the PNP alienates people who are not willing to choose Democrat or Republican. Is that true? I can't answer for anyone's alienation, <laughs> but the law says if you don't choose the ballot, you don't vote. Are we expecting that election judges will need to take a deep breath and calmly explain to people that yes, this is completely different from what we have done before, but with this election, if you don't choose a ballot, you can't vote on a ballot. And some people may well say, well, just give me both of them, and then you know I'll rip up one. No, no. Yeah. I can see them laughing. Yeah. yeah. Every physical ballot is counted and tracked. So we couldn't do anything like that. That if people are unhappy, if they feel alienated, and they know about it now, they should be on the phone or in their email with their legislators, because those are the folks who can change this. Okay. Uh, is there any state that uses ranked choice voting in their presidential nomination primary? Not that I know of. I, I don't follow a lot of ranked choice voting outside of Minnesota. We have three municipalities who use it right now, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park. Um, and generally, it seems to go pretty smoothly. I live in St. Paul, and I love ranked choice voting. And would I like it in the presidential? I would, because I'll tell you, my candidate is not going to win. I would love to vote for that person and then say, all right, I, I know they're not going to win, so here's my popular opinion where I think it's going to go vote. But we've got to see statewide before we see mm. um, national. And the feds, I think, are going to be a tough sell on that one if mm. ranked choice voting is something that you back. Okay. Can people who are in homeless shelters or residences supporting them caucus and vote in the PNP? And Definitely. And in, in November? We have, and um, I have it in the back if anybody wants to see it afterwards, but um, I have a, a, a handout that outlines the process for registering to vote and voting while homeless. The, the challenge, certainly, is that the way the process works is you register to vote, you get that postcard confirming where you live, and that completes the cycle of registration. If that postcard comes back as undeliverable, then you're registered but challenged. So when you show up, you basically have to register that day. You have to prove where you live. And a lot of homeless people don't have that option. But there are options. Um, one is that, uh, that if you interact with someone locally, uh, let's say you sleep in your car in the same parking lot every night, then people who live locally who you might interact with can vouch for you, the same vouching that exists. So there, there are things that homeless folks can do and it's easier if they're sleeping on someone's couch because they actually can get mail at that address. But um, I'll have that handout and we can talk more about that after if you like. Okay. Uh, will uh, voter data information be used by the parties in redistricting of a district? Redistricting happens, as far as I know, with the result of the census, not of who votes for whom. Although, honestly, the folks who do redistricting use that information. We've all seen really interesting, yeah, 
I was going to say shaping, but um, so there is manipulation, certainly is, and this information will just join the rest of the information that folks have in making those decisions. Okay. Um, at a national convention, if the candidate that earned a delegate uh, drops out before the convention, what happens to those delegates? That is a party rule. So I can't answer that. You would ask your party, mm -hmm. what, what's going to happen if candidate A drops out after the primary and they have, mm -hmm. um, they have votes? Okay. Um, so what is the likelihood that the Minnesota legislature will pass a bill in 2020 to protect voter data from that's, that's gathered in the PNP? In addition to not being a lawyer, I'm also not a legislator. I, if you want the most informed viewpoint on this outside of actually talking to your legislator, um, a woman in our office, Sam, is, the, is our legislative director. She has her fingers and feelers out. Uh, so if you call and ask for Sam Bonowith in our office, she would be the most well-informed as to what she's heard from legislators. but. I think with multiple bills being proposed so far, I don't know if there are more, uh, that I, I couldn't even guess for you. Would it have to be passed before the March 3rd primary? I mean, like, when they get that information from the primary, will that be shared automatically, like, immediately with the parties, or is that No, it, takes it's a while? going to take some time mm -hmm. to gather that information and create a report that respects the rest of the privacy information because they don't get everything. Mm -hmm. They just get certain things in that report. So I've been told it's going to take a little bit to get them those reports. Okay. Well, what is the future, what do you think is the future of the state party caucuses and party conventions? Uh, so caucuses differ from state to state that have them, right? Um, I, I <laughs> was going to talk about Iowa. App aside, <laughs> I, anybody ever watched the show The Good Wife when it was on? Right, so I'm re-watching that series, and I tend to listen more than watch when I'm doing dishes, or I, I just like to be entertained when I multitask. But I just saw an episode towards the end of the series that the main male character, Peter Florek, is running for president and they show a whole episode around the Iowa caucuses. And I love that because here, it's not a matter of physically moving people to your corner. There is discussion in the caucuses when we had that vote. And I'm sure there'll be discussions in the caucuses about who you should vote for on March 3rd. But it's, a, it's an active and interactive physical representation of convincing people why your candidate is the best. I, I find that wonderful. Uh, I'm sure that keeps a lot of people away who don't want people to challenge their vote and their choice. So from person to person, that may draw some people and may keep them away. Our caucus system, if it's still included and it may revert back, who knows. But if it still included this straw vote, some people were kept away because they could not physically attend. There's, there isn't childcare at every precinct caucus. Um, there isn't an early vote or an alternate date in Minnesota. Some states you may have heard are coming up with alternatives for early caucus voting. There are a lot of challenges with the caucus system. It removed voting. Having this primary allows parties to look at who actually shows up at caucuses because those are the people who are really connected to the party. And it may not be this year that shows it because there are still lots of people who don't know they're not going to make that vote on the 25th. <laughs> there are. I, I was telling Kathy earlier, we talked to literally thousands of people at the state fair in 
August of 2019, and easily 98% said, what primary now? <laughs> what? So last year, we didn't do, would you like to check your registration? You know, have you moved? It, it's usually registration based. Every come on to passersby was, have you heard about the new election in Minnesota? And people who stopped, and there were lots of people who stopped, said, you mean the presidential election? The, lots of people don't know. We get news in a different way than we used to. Lots of people who used to read a newspaper and watch Walter Cronkite every single night now look at Facebook and what people start talking about as a way to get some of their information. Or they have an app like uh, on iPhones with the news that only pops up certain stories. So there's a lot more filtering going on. I think this is a great opportunity for the parties to look at the caucus system as it exists with that vote taken out and find out if it's serving their, their needs. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so please talk some more about the uncommitted delegates. Why might I vote for them or not? I used to teach social studies as well as math. And I'll tell you that the way that I sold representative democracy to my students, and I taught middle school, uh, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the way that I sold representative democracy to my students is that imagine that you are able to hire someone to make an important decision or set of decisions for you because you trust them to make the right choice and you are able to tell them all about what's important to you before they make it. Is it perfect? No. That person may put anchovies on your pizza because they love anchovies. But the more sharing that goes on between you and that person you hire, the less likely that you're gonna get anchovies on your pizza or a flavor of ice cream you're allergic to, whatever it is. So in our system, I don't have time to read every bill and to go to every hearing in an attempt to put the needs, my personal needs and those of my community in the process. So my vote hires the person I trust to make those decisions and I just wrote Senator Chamberlain, Roger Chamberlain, my state senator, yesterday to talk about what I believed on these bills that are being filed about elections, about money, the HAVA money, the new round. I said, this is what I want you to vote. I know that he's likely not to follow any or all of what I said, but he's my guy. So. I, I think that, and I don't even remember the original question. <laughs> yes. So, thank you, and thank you. So this gives someone the chance to say, I generally agree with the principles of the Democratic Party, but honestly, I don't know all these people well enough to make an informed decision. I know that an uncommitted delegate, that their responsibility is to do what they think is right, and that's okay with me. That's what that allows. Which is so much better than what we hear from students sometimes. Young people who say, I don't know what a soil and water commissioner does. I'm, I'm not gonna go. Young people do not want to look stupid doing something new. We hear that all the time, which is why, and who did I tell? Um, but we have a statewide mock election that started in high schools in 2016 and repeated it in 2018, and literally hundreds of thousands of high school students participate every election year, every even year, and we've just uh, merged with a program uh, of Minnesota Civic Youth and the YMCA of the Twin Cities and we expect 500 schools and multiple hundreds of thousands of participating students from kindergarten through 12th grade, 
and I actually just got a call from an adult education center, part of the St. Paul Public Schools, asking if they and their 250 adults could participate. But my point is that we give them the experience so that when they walk into a polling place for the first time, they don't say, I don't know what to do. They say, where's that roster judge? Oh, there it is. Comfort, familiarity. The number of students who report to teachers, hold on. All I have to do is fill in that bubble. It's just like the ACT. They do standardized <laughs> testing all the time. But no one tells them that all it physically takes to vote is knowing who you want to vote for, but you got to fill in a bubble. So letting people know that it's OK, in this case, for you to go in and vote just for president, if that's all you know, or for president and senator. But look at what else is there, and next time, look into, let's leave judges aside for like third or fourth time, but <laughs> next time, maybe mayor, people who are close to you and make those decisions that affect you on a daily basis. The more local you get, right, in, in representation, the more you see those things on a daily basis. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll move on to the caucus presentation, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, don't applaud. I'm part of this, too. <laughs> I was thinking that we could start off just where people can see if they go on to mnvotes.org, they can find their precinct caucus. So I'll show them both, if you like. Sure. Um, so up on the screen is our elections and voting page. I had someone call me yesterday and angry, she said that, oh, um, yeah, okay. that um, we use a .org website, which is not as, uh, as good in security as a .gov website. And it, I tried three times to tell her that our .org only links you to our election vo and voting page. It's not a .org nonprofit website. It's just an easy to remember address. Will we go to a .gov at some point? Maybe. I talked to our cybersecurity guy, um, so that may be coming down the road. So on this page, mnvotes.org, you'll see two opportunities right on this front page. The first is in blue. And that's here under precinct caucuses. And right here is the caucus finder. We got all that information from the parties. You can find out where your caucus is. Back on that previous page, under the blue is the white. And under election day voting is find where I vote. That's the precinct finder. It'll not only tell you where you vote, but what precinct you're in, what congressional district you're in, what water and soil district, it, it's all there at the bottom of the page. And you can even click a link to get directions to your polling place, but most polling places are close to where you live anyway and you may be familiar. Good? Sample ballots. Ah, what's on my ballot, same page, I love this page, but this is part of what I do. So on the right, what's on my ballot? You can view your actual sample ballot, not just for this, by the way, for March 3rd, but 46 days before any election, you can go on our website, click what's on my ballot, view your sample ballot, and you put in your address because everything in elections is and in the census, and I hope everyone is looking forward to March 12th when that first mailing goes out, it, does everybody know that for the first time you get to fill out your 10 census questions online first if you want? So very easy. Um, if you don't have internet access, your librarian is set to help you. And I love the White Bear Library. Uh, so you put in your address and it will show you a list of everything on that ballot, but you can click view my sample ballot and it is the ballot. It's a PDF version, it says usually sample across the top, but it's exactly your ballot. What does that mean? 
It means if you are like me, I print it out, I fill it in as I do my research, and then I bring it with me to the polling place because I'm not gonna remember which one of those judges I said, okay, that's the one I wanna vote for. Anyone ever gives you a problem, you tell them that as a part of Minnesota law, that the Minnesota Voters Bill of Rights, which is in statute, includes you have the right to bring in a sample ballot. It's, I love that Voters Bill of Rights. We have a fact sheet on our website that, um, that includes what your rights are about getting time off from work and um, having assistance in the polling place, all of that under voter outreach materials, by the way, and fact sheets. So that's available on our website as well, the Minnesota Voters Bill of Rights. Anything else you wanted them to see? Uh, no, I think that's, that's a wonderful website. And uh, I would really encourage you to, to get your sample ballot ahead of time, especially for the, um, the general election that's coming up. Uh, people say that they don't know anything about the judges. You can have time to do your research. You can Google those people. Find out uh, what their background is. Uh, find out who's endorsing them and so on. There's really a lot of information that you, a lot of research you can do ahead of time, especially if you have that sample ballot in front of you. Yeah. As a ballot judge, I did see one person, this was several years ago, walk out with, I thought they were walking out with their ballot. Mm -hmm. It was a sample ballot that they had printed. And of course, it would never go through the machine. It would never work. And you may get stopped. Yeah. I, I excuse me. Work. Excuse me. Is that your ballot? But that, that's just being a good election judge. I have a quick question. Do you? Um, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I saw that I have a back hold. I'm sorry. I'll repeat the question for everybody. I saw that you have um, English on there. What other languages? Available. Great question. Um, we are updating everything right now, so I give you that as a warning, but, and this is the easiest way to show you, we have about a dozen fact sheets on our website. The left-hand column, and this is, I believe, why it's, it's laid out this way, but the left-hand column, those six, as well as voter registration applications, are available in 12 languages, English and 11 other. And sneak peek, not a lot of people know this, we're working with the Minnesota Commission on Deaf, Deafline, and Hard of Hearing to create ASL versions of these as well, as well as a walkthrough in ASL of the questions. You won't be able to register that way, but it will explain things about each question on the voter registration application with ASL, with a voice track, and with captions. Okay. So that right now, you're, if you click on any one of these on the left, you will only see English. That's because we have to retranslate every year that we do this, and we don't tend to translate in odd number of years. But every even year that we put these back out, we have to send them to a contracted translator. And in 11 other languages, that takes time. Shall we get to caucus talking about okay. caucuses? Uh, I just wanted to emphasize, though, that uh, Uh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, if you do have any concerns or questions about the presidential primary, uh, in, especially in terms of collection of data, um, we encourage you, it's on your program, to contact your legislators uh, and to contact the chairs of the election committees in the Senate and in the House. And your uh, parties. And your parties, definitely, right. Uh, you can talk about, do you want any data collected? If data is collected, uh, what's going to happen to that? Who's going to get it? Are there any restrictions on it? 
let your voice be heard and write those people, contact them, email them. Uh, I think that uh, legislators do listen. So this may go a little quickly, both for time and because we've talked a little bit about caucuses and vast majority of you have been to a caucus. Um, and this again is from the State League. Uh, we already got a League of Women Voters, how old, what you do introduction, so we'll skip that. Precinct caucuses, we talked about what they actually are. Um, Tuesday, February 25th, we did talk about that. It begins at seven. My understanding and my experience is that it's not like the beginning of a league event. Um, starting on time. When I went to my precinct caucus in 2016, the first 20 minutes was trying to find someone who would volunteer to chair the caucus <laughs> meeting. So um, just bring some snacks and a good attitude. That's it. <laughs> We talked about where you can find your caucus locations. There are different kinds of parties in Minnesota. I talked about the four major parties and that qualification is 5% of statewide voting um, where you have um, candidates and the four listed in alphabetical order are the DFL, the Grassroots Legalized Cannabis Party, the Legal Marijuana Now Party, and Republican Party of Minnesota. But major parties are not the only parties in Minnesota. There are minor political parties. Green Party, Independence Party, Libertarian Party, and you may recognize some of those names as formerly being major parties in Minnesota. And they can be major parties again. It all depends on that percentage of vote. And these definitions, as it says at the bottom of this page, uh, these are inscribed in statute. So the, they're, um, this is not a, oh, let's do 5%. It's not like that. Major parties are required to follow certain rules regarding precinct caucuses that are set by law. There aren't a lot of those laws. Many caucus activities um, are dictated by the party's own rules, and we talked about private organization. And minor parties may or may not even hold caucuses. Anyone can observe at a caucus. Doesn't matter what you believe, who you are. If you want to participate, you must be eligible to vote in the November 2020 election, we talked about 17 year olds, and live in the precinct. Why? Because these are set up by precinct, so it's the beliefs and the energy and the involvement by geographical area. And we talked about people on, who are 17. Do I need to be a registered member of the party? One of my favorite calls, and I answer the election line in, uh, in the Secretary of State's office at times, uh, but one of my favorite calls is, uh, is it complicated to change my party registration? <laughs> because I get to say, done. What, how did you do, because there is no party registration in Minnesota, so no one knows and this is the exception, and this is why some people are either questioning, confused, or up in arms with the, the presidential primary, but there is no identification. When you print out a voter list, if you as a registered Minnesota voter request one of those lists, you don't get any party anything on that list because we don't have that kind of party registration. I don't believe it's unique to Minnesota, but there are lots of states that do have party registration. Um, and we talked about that, do you believe in the basic principles of the party? And that is an expectation. What happens, we talked about what would happen, choosing volunteer leaders, issues and ideas, making resolutions, 
that can become part of that party platform. Choosing delegates, we talked about that. Um, the delegates endorse candidates at different voting points throughout the process and those rules can differ by party. So check with your party if you have specific questions. Do you wanna take any of this or am I good to continue? Uh, I, I just wanted to point out that um, everybody should think about um, a resolution that they want to make. This is how you can really participate in the party. Uh, if you go to the party, major party website or whatever party you're, you're interested in, they'll have forms for you to use. Well, that, that will be later on in the slide. Yep. Um, and using those forms, you can say that I wish, I want the party to do something, say, for climate change. Or it could have to do with early childhood education, whatever. Uh, you make your party aware that um, this is an issue and Hopefully that proposal will be carried on to higher levels and become part of their platform. Uh, another possibility, and you may have seen this on social media, you may have received a mailing. Let's say you, you are part of a climate organization. They may have come up with a resolution which you can introduce in your local precinct caucus and if that resolution is introduced in caucuses across the state, then eventually, and, and is supported, eventually the party is going to not just see your resolution on um, micro loans for people who want to plant a particular kind of tree, but if it is a shared resolution that gets support from lots of different caucuses, that's why they put these resolutions out for you to print out and introduce at your precinct if you believe in it. What doesn't happen at a precinct caucus? That vote we've been talking about. Now there's the primary, so that vote that used to take place in the caucus no longer does. So resolutions are, in a fun kind of almost legalese, Robert's Rules of Order way, it has a way of presenting an issue or a problem and a solution or a point of view. And Nick has developed, <laughs> I love Nick, but um, it, you'll see, this example that he has come up with is a great example, in my opinion, except for the fact that it uses a long and tiring to pronounce set of words. So you'll see. Resolutions must be provided in writing. You wanna use the form that your party provides because it's easier and it will be laid out the way the party needs it to be laid out. So how do you present it? As we said, a statement of a problem or an opportunity, including some relevant facts, a rationale for adopting the position, why should it be adopted, and then a declaration, a statement, clear statement of what this policy and belief, this plank of the platform should be. And formatting the specifics are party specific, so you wanna check with your party. Here is an example, which I will read for you. Whereas purple people eater feeders represent 15% of the local economy in 13 Minnesota counties, and whereas, you see the whereas statements here, employers have been unable to recruit and train purple people eater feeders over the last five years, and whereas the state of Minnesota currently does not fund any programs for purple people eater feeder skill training, therefore be it resolved that the Woolly Party of Minnesota supports adequate state funding to technical schools and employers for the training and hiring of purple people eater feeders. The whereases are your statements of truths and issues, challenges, and facts, and then your therefore presents this resolution as a way to, here's something the party should back as a way to 
fix, solve, or otherwise declare a position. This we talked about, one of the challenges around voting in the caucus or even participating in the caucus at all is that there isn't a way in Minnesota to participate other than being present at 7 p.m. on that Tuesday night. You do have rights. You have the right to take off of work, um, to be at the precinct caucus. You must give your employer 10 days written notice. I will tell you, and this is a personal reaction, I'll give you that warning, but I've worked fast food, I've worked as um, a busboy and a server and a cook in my youth. There aren't necessarily people to cover your shift. It's a tough deal because your boss can be the person who schedules you. And maybe you find that you're not considered as reliable. It's a very tough position to be in to utilize this legal right but you do have it. And honestly, the f it's 10 days by law, but a month ahead, you know, the soonest that someone can give their boss that notification that I can't work that night, or I've gotta be out by 6.30, whatever it is, the better. Public universities, community colleges, and public schools cannot hold classes or events after 6 p.m. on the evening of the precinct caucuses. I worked at a Noka Ramsey for 10 years and uh, Minsku, now Minnesota State institutions, take that very seriously, uh, as all public schools that I'm aware of do. Accessibility needs, major political parties must attempt, I'm gonna stress that word for you, to provide you an interpreter by request if you are deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing. If you're visually impaired, you also have the right to get written caucus materials ahead of time by request. I can tell you two things. One is that the fact that they must attempt does not mean that you'll get an interpreter. Um, they try, but sometimes there aren't interpreters available for that time, that night, that place. Um, and the other thing is that uh, if you know someone who needs either large print or braille presentations of materials, again, furthest ahead they can request it, the better. It does take time and it is expensive, but it, it's a part of what's offered. After the precinct caucuses, there are other gatherings. Um, there is the basic political organizing unit convention followed by congressional district convention, state convention, and the national convention. These are just larger and larger gatherings of these delegates to come together, work through resolutions and other party platform information, who's gonna go on to the state, et cetera. Unlike elections which are run by local and state government election officials, precinct caucuses are run by political parties. We talked about this. These are volunteers, many of them passionate volunteers, some of them brand new passionate volunteers. Um, so every aspect, uh, site location, meeting agenda, how well the meeting is run, it's the responsibility of the parties. So if you have a caucus issue, you can call the Secretary of State's office or the County Elections Office and say hello, but you're gonna be directed to the parties. There is here, but you can get this on our website and by a search online, contact information for the major parties, the minor parties, and the league. Wonderful. Anything to? No, but I think it's a wonderful way to participate um, you often meet your neighbors at these gatherings and uh, it's, it's a way to be civically involved. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Do you have questions that were turned in? Uh, I didn't see any questions coming in about the caucus. I have a question. Um, since I've only been to one caucus, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, for the resolutions, are they voted on at the caucus? 
Okay, and then where do they go if like a precinct to the next convention? Yep. Okay, and so then, that next level, and then they're voted on again, and then the next level. So is it at the national convention then when they decide whether or not it's going to be part of the party platform or? As far as I know, I've never been to a state, the state platform of each party has a platform. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you know, how does the national party platform get established if things aren't. The, are, the states then elect delegates to go to the national convention every four years and they vote on the, on the platform for the presidential. But the state of Minnesota, each party has their platform. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Jake. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, Mr. Wall, for everything you've done. Oh, Kathy, you have a thing to say? I did have a question. How many people have been online to the Minnesota State Legislature's website? Okay, maybe um, uh, this website has won many, many awards. It's a wonderful um, website. Maybe, Michael, you could uh, find it. You can uh, follow you, bills. Uh, or to, to find out uh, how to contact your state legislator, mm -hmm. your representative and your um, senator. You can get their uh, mailing address, their office, their... Um, uh, email address. Uh, some legislators will, if you send them an email using what they call an email form, they'll tell you right up front that they only really are concerned about their constituents. So if you, if you are not one of the constituents, if you send them a handwritten letter or a computer letter in the mail, the regular mail, you have a chance that that person is going to uh, get that letter. So, um, did you? I, just pointing out that one of the links on that front page of the Minnesota, Minnesota legislature's website is who represents me. So you put in your address and you get every level of representation that applies to your address. Right, early and often contact your legislators often. <laughs> so thank you again, Mr. Wall, for your uh, great My talk. My pleasure. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll stick around if anybody was shy about writing a card. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Oh, this one? This is GIS dot L-E-G for legislature dot M-N and it's easier to just go to the first one. It's, yeah. it's right here, and it's in your program. The legislative website is right here. Yeah. Thank you. It was fun. I